What, if anything, really needs to be done at the southwestern border? That's the question that led to a government shutdown. The question remained unanswered when President Trump gave up and agreed to end the shutdown on Friday. Lawmakers gave themselves three weeks to work out a border security deal. The president's chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, told CBS the fight isn't over. Keep in mind, he's willing to do whatever it takes to secure the border. The president spoke of another shutdown or declaring a state of emergency to get the money from elsewhere. He is still demanding that Congress pay for a wall, the construction project that he once promised Mexico would pay for. Beyond the symbolism of that demand, there is a whole range of border issues, what technology to use, how to manage asylum seekers, and much more. All right. We are joined now by NPR White House correspondent Tamara Keith. Good morning, Tam. Good morning. So uh, is it fair to say we are exactly where we were before the shutdown began? More or less, except that now America and federal workers and Congress and the president have all lived through the longest government shutdown, uh, partial government shutdown in U.S. history. And it wasn't pretty. Uh, and that might affect uh, how how everyone views the possibility of another shutdown in the future, uh, a future that is not that far away. Um, you know, the, the question before the shutdown began was more or less, what is a wall? Uh, right. What will President Trump accept? Is mm-hmm. it steel bollard? Is it replacing old fence? Is it only new wall? Does it have to be concrete? Can it be steel slats? And there's um, still no agreement on that definition. There, there really isn't. And there's been a whole lot of fighting um, about a wall. Nancy Pelosi still saying, have I not been clear? There will be no wall. But there's always been some nuance below the surface of that. Uh, Congresswoman from Florida, Democrat Donna Shalala, was on a uh, uh, weekend edition Sunday yesterday. And, and here's what she said. There always have, has been flexibility about fencing that needs to be strengthened. Uh, this, is not a, this is not a rigid position by the Democrats. I mean, in fact, I mean, it's been pointed out several times. I'm sure you and I have had this conversation. Democrats have funded border security even in excess of the five point seven billion dollars that President Trump wants for this wall. So they're on board with putting more money down there. Um, It's it's just the idea of funding what is President Trump's fundamental campaign promise. They don't want him to have that win. They they do not want to call it a wall. They do not think that five point seven billion dollars should be spent on wall alone. President Trump seems to be saying he in an interview with the Wall Street Journal um, said that he still wants the wall um, asked if he would accept 5.7 billion in the next round of nego- less than 5.7 mm. billion in the next round of negotiations according to this Wall Street Journal article he said last night I doubt it I have to do it right. Well, let's remember that this is only one of an incredibly broad range of border security issues and arguably not even the most important one. There are so many questions. How many judges do you have? How many border guards do you have? What are the rules under which they operate? What happens with asylum seekers? What has made this so intensively uh, Im- intensively difficult is that the president has insisted that the wall is the most important thing and it has symbolic importance both for him and for Democrats. But even people around the president have complained that there's so much focus on the wall. It is only the president himself who keeps bringing it back to that. Right. right. And there's a 17 member conference committee of members of Congress, appropriators, people who like to make deals, who are skilled at making deals, who are going to get together and look at these priorities. Um, the question, though, is in the end, if they come up with something, is it something that President Trump will be willing to accept? All right. NPR White House correspondent Tamara Keith for us this morning. Tamara, thank you. We appreciate it. You're welcome. So, meanwhile, Federal workers are finally getting back to work for the first time since the shutdown started. NPR's Bracton Booker has been talking to some of them here in the Washington area, and Bracton's in our studio. Uh, This has got to be an unsettling time, Bracton, for these folks. Yeah, to say the least. uh, You heard Tamara Keith describe the shutdown as not being pretty. Uh, I think a lot of uh, federal workers who've gone 35 days uh, without getting paid and 35 days, you know, of working in and not really knowing when the next paycheck is coming, it was downright brutal. I mean, some people ex- expressed uh, some excitement about going back to work, but really it was relief. Uh, some people said that they were depressed because they really didn't know when that next paycheck was coming. Right. I talked to uh, Terry, who is a uh, federal worker who works as a janitor in the uh, Smithsonian here in Washington. She says that lawmakers don't have any empathy for her or the rest of the federal workforce. And here's what she had to say. Hmm. My thing is I don't, 
I don't like being used. And that's what we feel like. We're being the ones pulled apart and plucked apart and left out to dry when these people that are making these decisions don't have the financial worries that we have. Right. A lot of these people just live in paycheck to paycheck. And Absolutely. when those paychecks don't exist, what are they supposed to do? And these are supposed to be stable jobs, right? Like for generations, working for the federal government was supposed to be the thing that gave you peace of mind. Right. Are these people suggesting it might not be that anymore? Well, though? now they're suggesting that perhaps uh, maybe the government is not that stable. And some people are starting to look or at least have conversations about looking to the private sector, especially those households that have both uh, husband and wife uh, working in the federal government. Oh, dual incomes that are tied to That are tied to, to, to the government. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I spoke with Andrea Jensen. She works for the Department of Energy. Her husband works for the Federal Aviation uh, Administration. And she said, you know, the shutdown really had her thinking and like, maybe it's not a really good, a really good idea to have both of them working for the government. Here's what she had to say. Hmm. Seems like there's more job security and not working for the same agency or having one person in private industry and one person in the government. So virtually all the federal workers I spoke to have no confidence that three weeks from now we're not going to be in the same predicament. So people are starting to budget. People uh -huh. are like really going to spend money on things that they absolutely have to spend money on and try to squirrel away the rest. Right. I want to note something quite profound that has perhaps happened over the last month or, th or a little bit more. And Tamara Keith alluded to the fact that the pain of this shutdown has to be part of the political calculation as President Trump decides if he wants to shut down the government again in a little less than three weeks here. Uh, federal workers have been portrayed as faceless bureaucrats, as evil elites, as out-of-touch beltway types. But for the last 30 days, we have seen federal workers as people that Americans at large can relate to, people who are caught up in broader problems of income inequality, people who don't have a lot of money in the bank. P Americans have related, I think, to this pain, according to surveys, and that is something that lawmakers will have to consider if they think it's going to be a good idea to shut down the government again. Speaking of these people, though, Brockton, just real quick, they're supposed to get back pay, right? They're supposed to be getting back pay. It could come uh, as early as this week, but look, payroll employees were also furloughed, so we're thinking maybe it takes a little time to get the mm. systems back up and running, oh, so man. maybe the, by the end the of the week people they people who all... send the paychecks out weren't yes, working. Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay, NPR's Bracton Booker, thanks so much, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Okay, so today is another inflection point in the trial of drug kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. The prosecution rests its case today. Federal prosecutors have presented dozens of witnesses to testify over the past three months, and now it is the defense's turn. Guzman faces 17 counts a link to running the world's largest drug trafficking organization and has already been convicted, of course, of crimes in Mexico. All right, we've got Keegan Hamilton on the line. He is U.S. editor for Vice News. He hosts a podcast called Chapo Kingpin on Trial, so he's been following this real closely. Keegan, thanks for being here. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, the prosecution is about to have its last act here. What are you expecting? So they've got their last cooperating witness on the stand. He was a former bodyguard and hitman for El Chapo. He should finish up uh, sometime this morning, and they'll have two law enforcement witnesses, and then that's it. And then it's the defense's turn, at which point they may or may not uh, call their defendant, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, to testify on his own behalf. Do you know what the, what the pros and cons are of having Guzman up there? Well, the, the cons are obvious and, and large in that is that he opens himself up to cross-examination from the government when they can ask about basically all of the evidence that's been heard, all of these crimes that he's accused of. Anything that came up in the testimony could potentially be fair game uh, when he can either you know, open himself up to perjury, which is the least of his problems. Uh, the, the pros for the government is that they, he can essentially get the last word. I mean, he's, he's heard you know, dozens of his former associates get up and testify against him. This would be his chance to tell his side of the story. Um, what has it been like watching him through these proceedings? You know, for the most part, he, he has been uh, pretty cool and collected. He's, he's, you know, some cases staring down the witnesses. He's taking notes, passing it to his attorneys. He's flirting with his wife in the, the audience of the courtroom. But there have been a couple moments when the testimony was really devastating where he, he almost hung his head a little bit and it seemed to sink in that uh, the case was not going as he hoped it would go. 
Can you give us some description of of just some of the moments that have stood out? I mean, there have this is an exceptional trial in so many ways, but the jury, just when you think they can't be shocked anymore, it's, they're presented with evidence that that does just that. The the end of last week was particularly shocking. You know, we've heard references to to murders and violence throughout the trial, but the testimony from his his former bodyguard and hitman that you know personally described him as personally committing torture and murder. Um, just some very graphic and gruesome descriptions of, of people being uh, buried alive, tortured. Uh, it, it really sunk in. You had thousand yards stares in the eyes of the jury, uh, and I think everybody in the courtroom who thought they'd heard it all uh, was shocked by what they were hearing with that witness. That Guzman himself was committing these atrocities. That he was personally pulling the trigger uh, on at least three murders, and was uh, in some cases, you know, beating. Uh, rival cartel members who had come into the custody of the, the Sinaloa cartel. It was pretty disturbing stuff. Is there any way he is is not convicted on all these counts? It, it's hard to see a way. Uh, I think the defense at this point is hoping for a mistrial or a hung jury or something along those lines that, that gets them out of this without a full acquittal. Hmm. Keegan Hamilton of Vice News talking about El Chapo's trial. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks again. We know Roger Stone's public position. Now, what is his legal defense? Yeah, President President Trump's longtime friend and advisor is scheduled to be arraigned today. He was arrested Friday, accused of lying to Congress, witness tampering, and more. Since Stone's arrest, he has gone on TV multiple times. And yesterday on Fox, he echoed President Trump's words about Russia's effort to sway the election. I'm not going to testify against him because I possess no negative information. Uh, There is no Russian collusion. This is a witch hunt. The federal indictment described Stone acting as a conduit between the 2016 Trump campaign and the organization WikiLeaks. NPR justice reporter Ryan Lucas is here. Ryan, good morning. Good morning. Why would Stone be so public about his defense in just this way? Well, first of all, no one has ever accused Roger Stone of being a shrinking violet. That's just not his personality. (laughs) This is a man who is a self-described political dirty trickster. He loves a political fight. He loves the spectacle. Uh, When Donald Trump fired him as a campaign advisor, we should just note for a moment, he said Roger Stone was too much about himself. Donald Trump felt that Roger Stone was too much about himself. Anyway, go on, go on. Anyway, um, so... Remember, after his court hearing, Stone stepped out of, uh, after his court hearing in Florida, Stone stepped out on the courthouse steps, flashed that V for victory sign that Richard Nixon made famous. Right. Uh, Stone has used his own Instagram account since his arrest on Friday to mock Robert Mueller and his investigation. As for the TV interviews, Stone has used those to take aim at the FBI and Mueller. He has argued that having heavily armed FBI agents knock on his door first thing in the morning, take him into custody, that that was an abuse of power. I will say that legal experts say that what the FBI did was actually pretty standard in a case in which prosecutors have concerns that a defendant could tamper or destroy evidence. Um, Stone has also used his TV uh, appearances to appeal for money to help his defense fund. Okay, so he gets his side of the story out. He asks for a little bit of help for the lawyers. Now he's in court, presumably with a lawyer. What happens in an arraignment, by the way? Well, he will be read the charges. There are seven counts in this indictment against him. Uh, Those include obstruction of an official proceeding, witness tampering, and making false statements. The allegations all relate to efforts that Stone made to contact WikiLeaks about hacked Democratic emails during the campaign to find out what WikiLeaks planned to do with those materials. And Stone also tried to keep some of those efforts uh, those about those contacts secret. Stone will enter a plea today. He has said over the past few days that he will plead not guilty. The magistrate judge could impose a gag order in this case. Um, that's something that we saw in Paul Manafort's case in D.C. here. Um, that's what will take place inside the courthouse. Now, I'm also very curious to see what is going to transpire outside the courthouse. You remember the scene in Florida on Friday, this raucous scene with the yeah. crowd jeering Stone, chance of lock him up. Um, it will be interesting to see if we see something akin to that here in D.C. Another thing that will be interesting to see is what exactly is meant by a statement by the acting attorney general that the Mueller investigation will be finishing soon. What exactly did he say? Uh, Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker was asked about the Russia investigation at a news conference yesterday. He said that he's fully briefed on the investigation, and then he added this. The investigation is, uh, I think, close to being completed, and I hope that we can get the report from Director Mueller as soon as as possible. 
This is the first we've heard anything like this from a senior Justice Department official. This is not a concrete timeline. Whitaker did not define what he meant by close, but this is the first thing that we've heard like this. And from a it's also a little odd because he said that in passing while trying to answer a question about something else. So it is hard to know how much it means. Right? Exactly. Ryan, thanks very much. That's NPR's Ryan Lucas. Thank you. Exactly what evidence does the United States have on the Chinese company Huawei? Up until yesterday, we knew the U.S. was seeking extradition of a top executive detained in Canada. We also knew the U.S. has been campaigning to restrict the telecom giant's business around the world. Now the U.S. has filed criminal charges against the company itself. It is accused of stealing trade secrets, of lying to banks, and violating U.S. sanctions against Iran. Acting U.S. Attorney General Matthew Whitaker announced two indictments against Huawei one centers on a robot named Tappy. Huawei's engineers allegedly violated confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements with T-Mobile by secretly taking photos of the robot, measuring it, and even stealing a piece of it. Stealing a piece of it. The piece was Tappy's arm. Hmm. The indictment alleges Huawei management offered its employees bonuses for stealing technology. For more on the story, we go to NPR's Rob Schmitz in Shanghai. Hi there, Rob. Good morning. Uh, I guess we're hearing so much about Tappy, this robot, not because it's the biggest industrial theft ever, but because it's a thing that, that, that prosecutors think they can, can prove. But what, what is the story there? Well, this indictment stems from a civil suit that T-Mobile won four years ago against Huawei for stealing T-Mobile's technology. Now, the Department of Justice is filing criminal charges against Huawei for this, and this involves that robot named Tappy. Uh, Tappy was created by T-Mobile to test phones. At the time, this is seven years ago, Tappy was cutting edge. No other cell phone maker had a robot like this. Hmm. Huawei at the time was a much smaller company and its phones were not good. So Huawei entered into a business agreement with T-Mobile that allowed its engineers to use Tappy at T-Mobile's factory. And according to what at times is a comical email trail, Steve, uh, Huawei engineers bungle their way as they try to figure out how Tappy works. They take illegal photos of Tappy. They email measurements of the robot back to managers in China. They ask so many questions about Tappy that T-Mobile tells them to stop or they'll be thrown out of the factory. And at one point, one Huawei engineer dismembers Tappy to steal its arm and bring it home in a bag. Poor Tappy. Right. I feel kind of sympathetic for the, the robot <laughs> now. But this is serious stuff because, according to the United States, this is part of a much larger pattern by this company, in fact, by a large swath of the Chinese economy to steal technology. How is this connected to the other Huawei story about the chief financial officer who's been detained in Canada and the United States wants to extra to the U.S. Well, that is a separate indictment uh, that was re was unsealed yesterday, and that indictment concerns CFO Meng Wanzhou, who is now in Vancouver and is being is awaiting her extradition to the United States. What's new in that indictment is the allegation that Huawei founder Ren Zhengfei, who is Meng Wanzhou's father was actually questioned by the FBI in 2007, and he allegedly hmm. misled them uh, when he was asked about uh, Iran sanctions and their violation of that. Remarkable that uh, China made him available for questioning, that he was willing to take the questions, but they say they didn't tell the truth. That's right, and uh, I think that this is definitely going to be playing into what will be uh, some pretty intense rounds of trade talks this week in Washington. Very briefly, how is China responding to all of this? Well, a Huawei spokeswoman said that uh, Huawei is denying all the charges, and she said it reached out to the Department of Justice to talk about Hmong, but they did not receive a reply. Beijing responded by saying the U.S. was violating the rights of Hmong Wanzhou. Uh, Rob Schmitz, thanks very much for the update and deepest sympathies to Tappy. <laughs> Thank you. That's NPR's Rob Schmitz. Okay, also, the Treasury Department has announced new sanctions against Venezuela. U.S. oil refineries will no longer send cash to the state-owned oil company. It is a move designed to pressure Nicolas Maduro, the president of Venezuela, to step down. Here's Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. And when you hear Mnuchin say, Peda Visa, he is referring to the state oil company. Today's designation of Peda Visa will help prevent further diversion of Venezuela's assets by Maduro 
and will preserve these assets for the people of Venezuela where they belong. Let's talk about this with NPR's Camila Domanowski, who's in the studios. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming by. So how does this work exactly? So these sanctions target PDVSA, the state-owned oil company, but they don't actually block U.S. refineries from accepting oil from PDVSA. They just can't pay for it by sending money back to Venezuela directly. Okay. Instead, that money has to go into a blocked account in the U.S. And we're talking billions of dollars here. All that money will stay in those blocked accounts and will be available if there's a new government that takes over in Venezuela. Um, I, I, don't, I assume that's because the Treasury Department has the authority to, to focus on the payments. Do we imagine that Venezuela is going to keep sending the oil to not quite get paid for it? That's an excellent question. I mean, this is different than just blocking a bank account where the money already exists and is in these funds, right? We're talking about ongoing oil payments. I spoke to Peter Harrell, who used to work on sanctions the State Department. He says this does pose a bit of a challenge to the Trump administration. Maduro still controls the production in Venezuela. And so in some sense, if they if they want a scheme where Maduro is shipping oil to the U.S. Uh, and not receiving payment for it, Maduro is still going to have to play ball. Oh, he, meaning that he would still have to say, OK, this is fine. I will allow the payment to be impounded and hope that maybe I'll get the money back later? Right. And so he could choose not to send crude oil to the United States. The problem is that it might be a little bit challenging to figure out where to send it instead. Uh, Not every refinery can take the kinds of oil that Venezuela exports. And places where uh, Venezuela does sell oil, aside from the U.S., include China and Russia. But China and Russia don't really pay for that crude oil from Venezuela either right now. They accept it as a debt payment. Hmm. So the U.S. is really Really important as a source of cash money for Venezuela. But whether that cash money is still a motivating factor when it's going into frozen accounts, that remains to be seen. Okay, so the U.S. is hoping to still get the oil, prevent Maduro from getting the money. Uh, in any case, Maduro will be prevented from getting the money, or mm-hmm. the Venezuelan government, we should say, will be prevented from getting the money. How does that fit into the broader U.S. strategy here? The U.S. wants Maduro out. So uh, Maduro declared a victory in a re-election where the election was disputed. And since then, the leader of the opposition, Juan Guaido, has also declared himself president. And the U.S. backs Guaido, as do a bunch of Venezuela's neighbors. Meanwhile, Maduro still has the backing of major Venezuelan allies like China and Russia. So these sanctions are part of the U.S. effort to put as much pressure on Maduro as possible to get him to step down and get the United States' preferred president actually in power. Economy's a total mess. Oil money is about all the government has left. Yeah, they're heavily relying on this. Camila, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That's NPR's Camila Domanowski. This morning, we're going to bring you everything you need to know about not one, Steve, not one, but two different sets of high stakes negotiations taking place in Washington. Okay, Republican and Democratic leaders are meeting to discuss border security. They need to agree on measures that can pass Congress and win the signature of the president in order to avoid another partial government shutdown in a couple of weeks. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell describes himself as flexible up to a point. And for whatever works, it prevents. The level of dysfunction we've seen on full display here the last month and also doesn't uh, bring about a view on the president's part that he needs to declare a national emergency. There's a little warning at the end there. Since the president has threatened to bypass Congress to have a border wall built, by declaring an emergency. So that's one negotiation. The other is, if anything, a much bigger deal. Chinese negotiators are in Washington to discuss a way out of a trade war. Oh, yeah, that. So NPR national political correspondent Mara Lyason is with us this morning. Hi, Mara. Hi, Rachel. Let's start with uh, the trade negotiations. U.S. uh, top trade negotiators, uh, negotiators sitting down with their Chinese counterparts. What is supposed to happen today? Well, the U.S. wants two things. The first thing is they want the trade deficit with China to come down. They want China, in other words, to buy more U.S. soybeans and other commodities. The second thing they want is harder to get. They want China to stop intellectual property theft, stop forcing U.S. companies to turn over their technology secrets. They want to stop China requiring U.S. companies to have a Chinese partner. In other words, they want China to change its business model. 
That's harder to do. The big question is, will Donald Trump settle for the first thing? In other words, will he just settle for China buying more soybeans or will he insist that China makes these structural changes? And then if the Chinese do agree to do that, how do you verify that? Right. And of course, all this is happening against this uh, backdrop of, you know, the the Chinese CFO of Huawei is arrested and all this international or intellectual property theft that you referred to. I mean, are they is the U.S. delegation expecting some kind of win out of this or is this an incremental development? Well, nobody says that this will be easy. The big question about the Huawei indictments is, will that become a bargaining chip in these trade talks? Or to put it another way, how does it not become a bargaining chip? And we don't know the answer to that yet. Let's pivot and and think about the negotiations on Capitol Hill to keep the government open. Uh, The team of 17 lawmakers has been tasked with with finding a solution that they couldn't find for for over a month. Uh, President Trump, in an interview with The Wall Street Journal, gave this effort a less than 50-50 chance of succeeding. So, uh, I mean, he's undercutting them before they even get going. Right. Well, the big question is, Democrats now have not ruled out spending some kind of money for border security, barriers, a smart wall. They don't want what they say is President Trump's medieval wall. And the president is no longer demanding 2,000 miles of sea to shining sea concrete barrier. He wants a couple billion dollars a year for 200 plus miles of border wall. And the question is, can they come up with a compromise that fudges this difference where both sides can say they won? Do you see that opening? Uh, I am not sure. I think it's possible we're headed for another impasse, but I don't think we're headed for another shutdown. You heard Mitch McConnell say he doesn't want the president to declare an emergency. He doesn't didn't say I'm worried the president will shut down the government again. Hmm. And Piers Mara Eliason. Thanks, Mara. Thank you. All right, let's shift our focus over to Venezuela. There are more protests expected there today and more pressure on President Nicolas Maduro to step down. Yeah, these will be the first mass protests since the opposition leader Juan Guaido declared himself as president or was declared by the legislature as president. They said they were following the Constitution. Guaido does have the support of the United States and other countries. He, uh, however, uh, President Nicolas Maduro uh, has ordered authorities in Venezuela, the Supreme Court, to put a travel ban on Guaido and all of his bank accounts have been frozen. And Pierre Philip Reeves joins us from Caracas, where he's covering all of this political drama. Hey, Phil. Hi. Uh, we've got a delay on the line. We should just note that. So the opposition led by Juan Guaido is calling for these protests. Is there an expectation they could get violent today? Well, there is. Yeah, he's calling for people to walk out. Uh, for two hours out of their homes and offices and shops and so on. And he's calling it for it to be a a non-violent protest. Uh, You know, he successfully summoned hundreds of thousands of people onto the streets last week. So I expect this will be large. Uh, Some areas we're expecting crowds. Others may just be people on the the streets banging pots and pans. Uh, We don't know how Maduro's security forces are going to react. According to the UN Human Rights Office, 40 people have been killed since the this crisis really erupted nine days ago, most by Venezuela's security uh, services. And yeah, the worry is there'll be more bloodshed. I mean, Maduro has told the Supreme Court uh, to put this travel ban on the opposition leader, Juan Guaido. At the same time, Maduro says he's open to negotiating, but that doesn't seem like a negotiating kind of posture to tell your opposition that, you know, your bank accounts are frozen and you can't go anywhere. What are the odds that these two men actually get in a room? Well, let's not forget that Maduro accuses Guaido of staging an attempted coup with the U.S. collaboration. So a travel ban is kind of uh, rather a light response. Uh, Most countries would be in jail if you were uh, also at the same time summoning summoning huge crowds out in the street to support you. So I think Maduro is uh, trying to feel his way here. He talks about negotiating. But, um, uh, you know, I can't see how the opposition will do that with a man they don't recognize as president, unless it's a specific discussion about his departure. 
Meanwhile, and also there's no yeah. sign that Maduro is interested in a discussion about his departure. I should add. I mean, Maduro is standing firm when it comes to the issue of his departure. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, the U.S. the Trump administration has cut off Maduro's revenues from oil and is exerting a lot of uh, of influence uh, in Venezuela in in hopes of pushing Maduro out of power. How is that being received? I mean, what do Venezuelans on the street, the protesters, make of the U.S. involvement? Well, I think the protesters appreciate it, but I think a lot of people are also very worried. It's very hard to see uh, how we can avoid uh, a a very violent situation evolving here. Let's say best case scenario that uh, Maduro goes. But what happens then? Will the police and the National Guard just show up for work the next day saying um, that, you know, the uh, Venezuelan uh, socialist experiments over? We work for someone else now. Uh, there's a very high risk there'll be a vacuum for a while while these security forces figure out who's in charge and while the strongly pro maduro elements disappear and remember this country's got a population that's very hungry and very poor mightily abused and angry i don't see how would have you can avoid a situation where in those circumstances there would be mass looting mm-hmm. and that's in the opposition's best case scenario thanks so Could much get much worse than that right thanks so much phil and here's phil reeves in caracas for us Okay, back in this country, Democratic presidential hopefuls are already staking out their positions on critical issues, including health care. Democratic Senator Kamala Harris spoke in a CN town hall meeting earlier this week and supported Medicare for all. It is inhumane to make people go through a system where they cannot literally receive the benefit of what medical science can offer. Yeah, in the town hall, she supported not only government insurance for everybody, but also eliminating the private insurance industry. Who needs it, she effectively said. Afterward, her campaign walked that back, saying that she would be open to more modest reforms, which suggests just how politically tricky health care remains. All right. We have got NPR health policy correspondent Allison Kojak with us this morning. Hey, Allison. Good morning, Rachel. A, How are you? I'm well. This is a big question to start off our day here, but what does Medicare for All mean exactly? Well, it depends on who you talk to, but the plan that Senator Harris says she supports is the one that was proposed last year by Senator Bernie Sanders. And this would be a national health program that would as you, as you said, uh, replace the private health insurance system. Here's how she described it. Well, listen, the idea is that everyone gets access to medical care and you don't have to go through the process of going through an insurance company, having them give you approval, going through the paperwork, all of the delay that may require. So her idea is that everyone gets a Medicare card, just like the one that my mother has, and doctors have to sign an agreement each year to be part of the program. This is the same as when people say single payer. Exactly. Exactly. Um, The government is that payer. How how does she want to pay for this or any well, Democratic you know that, candidate for that matter? Exactly. I mean, that's the big unknown. It's going to cost a lot of money. Harris said in that town hall and when I asked her staff, they didn't respond. She didn't respond and she didn't describe it. In the, his proposal, Senator Sanders didn't put in a pay for, but he outlined some options. He says that overall, as a country, we spend $3.2 trillion a year on health care. And that includes Medicare, Medicaid, and our private insurance system. And he says Medicare for all will cost a lot less. Another analysis I've seen says the federal government will pay $32 trillion over 10 years to pay for Medicare for all. So the pay-for proposals mostly include maybe a tax increase on employers, similar to Social Security tax. Of one, one proposal is a 4% tax on everyone's income. Um, there's basically tax increase as on higher earners. It's, it's a way of increasing taxes and replacing what we spend right now on health care premiums. Since then, as Steve noted, though, Kamala Harris's campaign backed down a bit on this and said, uh, wait a second, she also might be willing to consider other more moderate proposals instead of uh, altogether single payer system, clearly indicating this is this is a political bugaboo for Democrats. It's not like they're all in line for this. Yeah, no, it's really tricky. I mean, a lot of people co-sponsored that bill, including other presidential candidates, Kirsten Gillibrand, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Warren. Um, but it's tricky because people like the idea of Medicare for all. But once you talk about the tax increases, it becomes much, much less popular. And here's Allison Kojak for us this morning. Thanks, Allison. We appreciate it. Thanks, Rachel. How cold has it been in the Midwest? We already know it is so cold that mail service was suspended in many places. 
And now we can add this. In Minneapolis, it is so cold. UPS driver Brendan Pena was told the decision to deliver packages is just up to him. Bosses basically told us at any point you feel like you don't want to work or it's too cold, you can't feel your fingers, you can't feel your nose, your face, come back to the building. Good rule of thumb. <laughs> right. In your St. Anyway. Paul, Minnesota, firefighters were told to work in 10-minute rotations. They are fighting a fire with all the heat that it produces, and it was still so cold that 10 minutes was the maximum they could be outside. Even in places where it was a bit less cold, National Weather Service meteorologist Trent Frey has this warning. Frostbite becomes a major concern for any exposed skin on the matter of about 15 minutes or so. You know, any prolonged exposure can, can be deadly in this case. We should say at least eight people have died in connection with this cold weather. It is a good day to check on people who are home alone. Which is why I called my mom in Indiana, where temperatures were six below zero this morning, which would seem warm compared with La Crosse, Wisconsin, where it is 30 below today. And that is where we find Wisconsin Public Radio's Hope Kerwin. Hope, good morning. Good morning. I guess this is the moment when you could say, oh, it's Wisconsin. We're used to cold weather. Uh, are you saying that? No, I don't think people are saying that here in the state. Actually, Governor Tony Evers uh, issued a state of emergency, declared a state of emergency earlier this week uh, because of the, the cold temperatures. Mm. Um, we, you know, we saw some wind chills get down to negative 55 degrees. That's 55 below zero. Um, and so, you know, that's that's obviously a huge risk to people's health. And, um, you know, a lot of things were canceled yesterday and into today. You know, I noticed that here where the temperatures were above zero, but but in the teens, it actually feels kind of nice if there's no wind blowing. But the second there's the slightest puff of wind, you want to get out of there. Is that what it's like there, only worse? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely that classic. You feel just kind of your face freezing, any exposed skin that's, that's you know, it, exposed to the cold definitely constricts and, you know, you immediately feel it as soon as you step outside. I would imagine that this is uh, immediately a perilous situation if somebody's heat goes off. How are authorities making sure the heat stays on in Wisconsin? Well, we did see some um, outages, some power outages um, in, on Wednesday morning just due to power lines breaking because of the heat. Um, but, you know, really people are just encouraging people to keep their thermostats at a comfortable level and to just constantly check on um, pipes, water pipes and faucets as well. That can be another, um, you know, just kind of infrastructure related problem. And so people are just really, you know, encouraging people who are low income to keep their thermostat up um, and worry about paying the utility bill later. Uh, in my hometown, I was told uh, the schools are closed, of course, but the school buildings have remained open. People can go there if the heat goes off. Are people doing things like that where you are? Yeah, a lot of places is, have opened as emergency warming shelters. Uh, a police department in the town where I'm at actually opened it, and it's open to anyone who needs to have a warm place. Okay, uh, Hope, I hope you are somewhere warm at this moment anyway. I am. Okay, Hope Kerwin of Wisconsin Public Radio. Is Facebook really paying a price for a string of data privacy scandals? Yeah, the social media giant faces yet another one. Both Facebook and Google, we should note, were exposed for getting around efforts to limit their harvesting of data. The companies offered cash and other gift incentives to users who would then allow apps on their phones that monitor almost everything that they do on their phones. Facebook was targeting users young as 13 with us. It is the latest in a string of revelations about privacy issues the company has faced, but they are still making money. Facebook announced record profits in its fourth quarter yesterday. NPR's Jasmine Garst has been covering this story from New York. Jasmine, good morning. Good morning. Uh, first, what does this mean, an app on your phone that monitors almost everything? Yeah, so th both in both these cases, these were apps which users gave permission for their data to be collected. And the point is for these companies to understand users better. Now, in the case of Facebook, it was particularly invasive. I mean, participants were giving permission to have pretty much everything monitored. Social media messages, Internet activity, uh, what other apps you have on your phone. Although somebody might say, well, people opted in 
to, to do this and got some kind of compensation for it. Why is that a big deal? Well, absolutely. I mean, in the case of Facebook, uh, they were targeting a very young audience, some as young as 13. Um, and there's the argument, that, yeah, they knew what they were getting into. I mean, but really, who is reading the fine print? That's what tech activists would say. It's probably not a 13-year-old. Um, and then there's the fact that Facebook keeps breaking Apple's terms and conditions with this kind of behavior. Oh, uh, let's remember here, of course, Apple, huge maker of, of, of iPhones. They like to promote the iPhone as a refuge, a relatively private uh, place. And had, they, they'd been trying to keep Facebook from doing this sort of thing. What, what's Apple have to say now? Well, you know, on Wednesday, Google took down its own app and Apple banned Facebook's app. Uh, it also banned uh, several of Facebook's internal apps, you know, the ones used uh, by employees in-house. Uh, Facebook and Apple have reportedly had a very chilly relationship precisely because of this, because Apple is uncomfortable with Facebook's constant disregard of privacy issue. Um, there's a history here. Uh, here's uh, Apple CEO Tim Cook publicly chastised. Facebook. We could make a ton of money uh, if we monetized our customer, but you are not our product. Just a different business model. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, what is uh, when you say there's a history here, how have the two companies argued back and forth over time? Well, essentially, Tim Cook has said, uh, you know, uh, we don't want people to be our product. Uh, and Facebook very much gets its profit off of advertising. Uh, that That's where Facebook's money comes from. And so Facebook is constantly in this conundrum of how to respect people's privacy while still making a profit. OK, so you just mentioned profit. Help me understand this. Facebook faces way more than a year, a couple of years of horribly embarrassing headlines, congressional hearings, yet another scandal, and they just posted record profits. I think this is the big question of our moment. Uh, at what point do users say enough is enough? I mean, the reality is whether or not people knew exactly what they were getting into with these apps, a lot of people and a lot of young people signed up to have a certain amount of their privacy explored by these companies. Uh, and in the case of Facebook, for just $20 a month, and I think it speaks to a younger generation that grew up with a very different concept of privacy than the rest of us. And they're going to have to grapple with this question of when is it enough? Uh, because as the profit notation uh, demonstrates, Facebook does know how to make money off of the data that they are they are gathering on you. Absolutely. Jasmine, thanks so much. Thank you. And Pierce Jasmine Garst. Some other news now. How much pressure does China really face to end a trade war? The U.S. and China are in trade talks this week. President Trump is demanding big changes. He's already imposed tariffs on many billions of dollars worth of Chinese imports. He is threatening to raise those tariffs in these talks that are happening this week. And if those talks fail to force big changes in Chinese economic policies. Economists have pointed out that it's really American consumers who pay the taxes on imports. But it's also true China's economy is slowing down. NPR's Rob Schmitz joins us now from Shanghai. Hey there, Rob. Good morning, Steve. OK, so these talks are taking place in Washington, right? There's a Chinese delegation here where I am and the head of that delegation meets President Trump himself. What's on their agenda? So the head of the delegation is Liu He, and he's looking for a couple of things for China today. He's going to gauge President Trump on what China needs to do to make Trump comfortable about making a trade deal. He's also looking for how serious President Trump is on making that deal. I spoke with China expert Bill Bishop about this, and he pointed out that from Liu's perspective, the Chinese delegation thought they had a deal in 2017 meeting with Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. And last year, they thought they had a deal with Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. But in both cases, President Trump said it's not enough and, and blew up the deal. And so I think they're very nervous that unless they can get in the room and get the president to say we're done, that they're going to be basically embarrassed yet again. This is something that uh, the president's allies in Congress have had the same complaint about, that it's hard to know what he really wants, hard to get him on the record and keep him there. Yes, yeah, Stephen. And what Bill means by getting him in the room here is that he thinks one of Liu's goals today will be to convince President Trump to meet with Xi Jinping to make a deal. And if you look at the president's calendar, he does have an outstanding meeting planned with Kim Jong-un somewhere in Asia in the near future. So perhaps the thinking here is to have 
President Trump swing by Beijing at that time to put an end to this trade war once and for all. Uh, the hope of imposing these tariffs is that China would feel pain and feel more and more pressure over time to make a deal. Is it working out that way? China's economy is hurting. Uh, just last night, in fact, more than 400 Chinese companies posted profit loss warnings for 2018, mm. and the impact from the trade war has only started. So the Chinese are likely prepared to make some concessions on items like IP protection and reducing the trade deficit. What's probably not going to happen that the U.S. is looking for is China making structural changes to its economy and reducing the power of its state-owned enterprises that are blamed for creating this unfair playing field for U.S. businesses. China's Communist Party exerts economic and political control through these companies, and Xi Jinping is unlikely to cede that to the Trump administration. Oh, okay, so structural changes, no. What about changes to the use of, 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 of trade secrets or the stealing of trade secrets or the handing over of trade information? Is China willing to change that? I think that's definitely going to be a part of what the Chinese will offer. This is something that the Chinese have already talked about uh, when you look at their policy changes going forward, that they want to help IP protections inside of China, not only for U.S. businesses, but, you know, Chinese companies are now making stuff that's worth stealing, too. And so they want to protect their own businesses. <laughs> OK, too. Rob, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That's NPR's Rob Schmitz.